Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Dr. Michael Berm from the Boricino Collaboration to the show. He recently led a new study examining neutrino emissions from the sun, revealing details of the nuclear furnace burning at the heart of our parent star. But first, we head out to the outskirts of the solar system, where the long-lived Voyager spacecraft have seen quick moving particles driven off the surface of the sun. We are also going to journey back in time to the formation of the moon, as researchers using supercomputer simulations recreate a tight Panic collision between the Earth and a Mars-sized body four billion years ago. Then we're going to take a look up in our own night sky, readying ourselves for the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn taking place right on the winter solstice. Cosmic ray electrons negatively charged particles driven off the Sun have recently been seen by the Voyager spacecraft for the first time. Previously predicted by physicists, these electrons are launched from the Sun by coronal mass ejections and accelerated by magnetic fields surrounding our parent star. Launched in 1977, the Voyager spacecraft are the only human-made objects to pass so far beyond the heliopause, one of the borders marking the edge of our solar system. The formation of the moon in a collision between the early Earth and a body called Theia uh, have been recreated in supercomputer simulations. These simulations performed at Durham University show that if they had almost no spin prior to the impact, it could have created a body much like our own moon. Simulations also show that just a little spin would have resulted in the Earth being surrounded by two moons. On December 21st, 2020, Jupiter and Saturn, the two largest planets in our solar system, will appear just one-tenth of a degree apart, or one-fifth of the diameter of a full moon. This is the closest visible conjunction of the planets seen since the year 1226, and such a sight will not be seen again until the year 2080. This great conjunction taking place along with the winter solstice will easily be visible to sky gazers around the world in the southwestern sky a little after sunset. Subscribe to or follow the Cosmic Companion for more details on this once-in-a-lifetime event, including our own original series of sky charts and videos. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time, and the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we're going to talk to Dr. Michael Firm of the Boracino Collaboration, who recently uncovered details of reactions at the core of the sun using a unique detector buried underneath a mountain.
This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Dr. Michael Fern. He is a, uh, from the Porcino Collaboration, and he's recently found some interesting things about the core of our sun. Uh, welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So tell us just a little bit about uh, what it is you found and what makes it so interesting. Now, our experiment is uh, a detector that is steep underground and it's looking for neutrinos coming out of the sun. So I should probably first explain a bit about what a neutrino is before going on. So it is uh, an elementary particle like the electron, but difference in the electron, it does not have an electric charge, so it passes through normal matter more or less without doing anything. And this means that in our ordinary lives we don't recognize them, but uh, it turns out they are pretty neat probes for looking into stars, and uh, as the Sun is our closest star, it's actually a, a very bright neutrino source. So the experiment I'm working for Borexino, this was built specifically to do a measurement of the neutrinos coming out of the sun and uh, to measure not only how many they are coming, but also their energy spectrum in order to be able to distinguish different kinds of neutrinos that are produced in nuclear reactions inside the sun. So if you want, this is a machine that can tell you from the neutrinos that are emitted in these reactions, what kind of fusion processes are going on in the center of our star. Hmm. And so what is it about the neutrinos that you're looking at versus, let's say, your typical neutrino that, that's whizzing past? Now, actually, we, on, on first principles, we have no way to decide whether the neutrinos we see are from the sun or not. But uh, as I already said, the sun is uh, the brightest neutrino source that we have on Earth. So even if it obviously it's quite far away, it's still in comparison to all other sources of neutrinos so bright that we can, let's say, easily identify them as soon as we are certain that we what we have in our detector is a neutrino. So actually the, the art, if you like, in detecting them is to make sure that you um, suppress all other background sources that there are on Earth and there are, in fact, there are many, so that is why the detectors, neutrino detectors in general, are often under the Earth in order to shield us from surrounding backgrounds, cosmic rays, radioactivity, all these kind of things. And uh, then in addition, you have to make sure that your detector is very uh, clean, so very pure from this uh, natural radioactive contaminants that is in all matter. So I think Mostly we don't notice it, but as in bananas, where everybody knows that there's a good load of radioactive potassium, uh, or in all other matters, there's a certain amount of the stuff. And when it decays inside our detector, on first principles, we have nothing to tell it apart from a neutrino signal, which is also just a neutrino bouncing into an electron in our uh, detector medium and producing a little flash of light. So one of the primary uh, challenges in building this kind of a detector is really to get the insides of it as clean as humanly possible in order so that this few uh, interactions of neutrinos that you see per day, you can make sure that this is really neutrinos. So just to give an order of magnitude, if you have like a, a ton of material and you wait for a day, you will typically see one of these neutrinos interacting. That's uh, the scale that we are dealing with. That's fabulous. And what you said, you know, neutrinos are incredibly hard to detect. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're doing it? What, what, what is this, what is this uh, detector look like and how does it work? So first of all, given that the rate of neutrinos in the detector is relatively low, you have to make it large. So uh, our detector from side to side is something like 18 meters in diameter. And most of it actually is shielding, so still from uh, surrounding radioactivity, but it's the innermost um, sphere of around three meters diameter. This is where we are doing the neutrino detection, and this is roughly 100 tons of 
a, a hydrocarbon liquid, so an organic scintillator, which um, has this special property that um, when a neutrino comes in and creates a charged particle, the charged particle will produce a, a flash of light in the material by exciting electrons that then bounce back to the ground state. And it is transparent so that the light can go out. And then surrounding the central medium are very sensitive light detectors that are sensitive enough to pick up single photons. And by counting these photons, you can first of all know that the neutrino was there, but you can also determine what was the energy of the neutrino. Wow. And then helps you reconstruct the, the spectrum of neutrinos that you are detecting. And actually this combination of being very pure and being able to resolve the energy of the interactions, this is what then allows you to tell apart different species of neutrinos and radioactive backgrounds that they are still in the detector. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how energy is produced at the core of the sun and where all these where all these neutrinos came from in the first place? Right. So the so sun is a main sequence star and main sequence stars produce their energy from hydrogen burning. And uh, you can do this as it turns out in many different fashions, but uh, the preferred way that it's done in the sun is really by combining, starting with hydrogen, so single protons, and putting it together step by step in order to form a, a helium-4 atom. And uh, when you do it like this, what you have to do, helium-4 is two protons and two neutrons in the nucleus. So you have to convert two of the hydrogen atoms that are basically protons to neutrons. And the only interaction in nature that can do that is weak interaction. And it can only do it while in addition, also producing two positrons that are just absorbed by the solar medium and two neutrinos. And these neutrinos, as we have uh, already established, are escaping the sun more or less uh, unhindered. So they are going out and uh, eight minutes later, they pass by the Earth and you are able to detect it. Wow. Go ahead. Now, as I said, what the sun prefers to do, or what is uh, the most frequent interaction in the sun, 99%, is this basic fusion reaction where you put together four protons without any additional aid and make a helium out of it. But as it turns out, there is a competing process um, where you use the fact that there is already, from uh, earlier stars, a little percentage of carbon and uh, nitrogen and oxygen inside the solar matter. And the carbon in itself can also capture a proton to form nitrogen and then it can capture a proton again and again and again. And in the end, the, you build up to nitrogen and oxygen, but in the end, you, this is, uh, stuff decays again into a carbon nucleus and a helium-4. So in this way, you trade, uh, generate helium as well, but it's like a catalytic process where the carbon is your catalyst. And because of this, it became called the CNO cycle for the three elements that are produced in the cycle, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And uh, while in the sun, this is a subdominant thing, so by now we know that it's on the order of 1%, um, in heavier stars, this is quite important. So um, we were curious to understand whether the sun is really doing that. There are predictions based on uh, the standard solar model, which is astrophysics combined with nuclear physics to tell you um, what is going on inside the sun. And uh, the expectation was that there should be a tiny amount of this uh, CNO cycle underlying the fusion, so that is usually done by this direct PP reaction. And uh, so what we learned now with Borgesino is that indeed there is this kind of reactions because we can see the neutrinos that are coming from them and we can tell them apart based on the energy spectrum of neutrinos that we observe. Wow, wow that's, that's pretty incredible. <clears throat> and are there other instruments uh, anywhere else that are able to detect the CNO neutrinos and tell them apart from uh, neutrinos produced in PP reactions? So right now, Boxino is the, the only experiment able to do this. So we were, if you want, we were the first that were 
were actually able to identify cis neutrinos as a different species. So there was a bunch of early experiments uh, 30, 40 years ago that were able to measure uh, an integrated neutrino spectrum and they must have measured them as well, but they were not able to tell them apart. So mm. the, if you want, the, the techno technological feat here was building a detector that is able to see this relatively small amount of neutrinos. Now to do this justice, what we could, uh, what we were able to do in Borgstino is show that the signal is there, so that the process is actually working, but we cannot yet tell very precisely what the weight is. So for sure there's uh, room for future experiments that uh, are even more sensitive than Borgstino now is in order to uh, do a more precise measurement. Mm -hmm. And as you know, as you mentioned, the there are just you know billions and paraphrase Carl Sagan billions and billions of neutrinos, you know, just spinning through you know every square centimeter of Earth and you know every second of the day. Um, but with all these neutrinos out there, uh, you know, obviously you would think there would be. Are, are there other ways of detecting these neutrinos other than building these, you know, huge tanks of scintillating fluid and burying them underneath a mountain? Uh. So, <laughs> in, in fact, there is some variability, but it's not as large as you would hope because in the end, you always come down to the fact that weak interaction that neutrinos is the only force that neutrinos are participating is weak. So you need large volumes in order to be able to see the detectors. So all the detectors that we have today are similar in the sense that they use either large volumes of water, large volumes of liquid noble gases, large volumes of liquid scintillator in order to do the detection. One should say that there is an interesting idea that you could uh, use usually very cool detectors, uh, so cold, um, to do a detection where neutrinos interact not on individual nuclei inside the nucleus, but using a, a quantum mechanical interference effect where they are beginning to scatter from the whole nucleus at the same time. And this has a larger cross-section and means that you will get a higher rate with a smaller detector. But still, you will need a pretty large detector in order to do uh, a detection, even if it's maybe not 300 tons as in our case, but only 30 tons. <laughs> wow. And so what can, what can this teach us about um, other stars other than the sun, especially massive ones that we look right. at? So as I already said, uh, in the sun, the CNO cycle is uh, a minor process, let's say, about 1% of the neutrinos of the energy are produced in this way. But the reason for that is that the center of the sun is simply not hot enough to make it happen, uh, happen very often. So in the end, whenever you try to squeeze these protons together in order to form helium, you have to overcome Coulomb forces. And the hotter the material is, the more energy is in the protons or in the protons and carbon in the case of the CNO cycle, and the more likely this transition comes. And it turns out that the sun, 50 million degrees, is not so bad. But if you have a few million degrees more at some point, uh, the, the CNO cycle becomes more and more probable to happen. And uh, a sun about double the mass, then uh, a star about double the mass of our sun, it will already mostly burned by the CNO cycle and the happy stars, so the 10 to 30 solar masses, they are, to our understanding, they are mostly working on the CNO cycle and uh, the speed train is only a small contribution. So that is why yes, it is interesting to have this uh, measurement inside the sun because you can extrapolate from them to understand better how the hotter stars are working. And also in our sun, there will be a change over the time because it's also getting hotter in the inside. So at the end of its life, probably 30% of the energy will be coming from CNO instead of the 1% now. Wow. And that was, uh, that was uh, actually going to be my next question is how will um, the, re the difference, how will this, how, how do stars, including the sun, change 
uh, as they go through their life cycles, you know, using the PP versus CNO or other reactions? Yeah, so basically, um, this trend that as stars go older, they grew, they blow up a little, they get a bit more, uh, they slowly burn up the hydrogen to helium in the center. And as a result of that, they are contracting somewhat and getting also somewhat hotter in the center. So simply by the fact that uh, energy production gets a bit less efficient, they have to, to squeeze a bit in order to get even more temperature so that the uh, fusion reaction rates get higher. There's a second thing involved in that, and that is where we again think that the CNO cycle might be interesting to understand for the sun, uh, that how much of CNO reactions you have depends crucially on how much carbon you have. So um, looking for this neutrino is a very neat way to find out what is the exact contribution or the exact abundance of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen in the core of our sun. Um, that is something that people have been interested in now for the last 10 to 20 years because there is a bit of a controversy in astronomy about how, how much carbon there really is inside the sun. So astronomers talk about metallicity when they talk about elements that are heavier than lithium. And um, depending on, um, so if you go more than 20 years back, there was always a very nice agreement between measurements that you can do of the elemental composition of the sun based on the Fraunhofer lines. So the absorption lines in the spectrum of the sun. And what you get when you do measurements of the sound waves that are propagating through the sun. So there's a whole field of research that's called helioseismology that just looks at these waves that are passing along the surface and in the inside of the sun. And this propagation of the waves you can use in order to deduce properties of the sun. For instance, the sound speed or uh, the temperatures inside. And this depends uh, to a certain extent on what are the elements inside the sun. And for a long time, one thing that gave us real confidence about that we understand how the sun is working was that these measurements of spectroscopy and of field seismology, they were in a perfect agreement, sub percent level accuracy of overlap. Why the neutrinos were terribly off, because we did not know that the neutrinos are undergoing oscillations, change that hype. And this was a big puzzle for a time. While now, actually, um, these metal abundances that you can get from um, looking at the Fraunhofer lines, this has been reevaluated. So people have used the fact that now we have better computers, better ways to model these absorption lines to take into account more effects in order to do a more precise determination of what the metallicity should be. And lo and behold, it changed. Actually, the current predictions are lower and are now in a worse agreement with what you get from helio seismology. And now there are two possible solutions of what are the elemental abundances in the sun. Are they more like what uh, the Fraunhofer lines tell you? Are they more like helio seismology? And neutrinos, in a way, you could hope that they can give you an answer because they are independent of them, but the neutrino rates, not only CNO, but CNO the most, are depending on the metallicity. So, abundance of, uh, of the heavy elements. So the verdict is still out. We don't know yet. Also, this new measurement of us is not precise enough that you can tell. But there is a, I think they, for the first time, actually, when it comes to the sun, you can use this neutrinos in a very practical way to learn something about uh, how it really works. It's fabulous. And finally, what's, what's next for you? What's, 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 your, what's, your next, uh, what's the next thing you're doing? So right now, um, we're actually wrapping up the experiment. So we will go for another half a year or so, and then we will close down. Um, but the next thing is actually on the horizon. So we have a, a successor experiment that will be constructed in southern China, which is uh, based on the same technology, but again, a good deal larger, so there, um, we will not have this 300 tons of liquid, but 20,000 tons of liquid. So you collect much more statistics. It, in case of solar neutrinos, it will give you 
much better opportunity to uh, do precise measurements of the different fluxes because you have so many events that you can count, uh, the uncertainties get much smaller. But then if you build a detector on the scale, it has to serve more than one purpose. So in this case, um, the main purpose actually is the measurement of neutrino properties based on uh, the neutrinos that are emitted by nuclear reactors in uh, two close by power plants. And uh, so this will be a project on the intersection of particle physics on the one hand, learning about neutrino properties, and then astrophysical observation of neutrinos on the other hand. Wow, that, that is just fascinating. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Michael. It was great talking okay. with you. And that was Dr. Michael Verm from the Boracino Collaboration. Next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we welcome Professor Seiji Sugita, planetary scientist at the University of Tokyo, back to the show. This, this researcher on the Hayabusa 2 mission to the asteroid Ryugu will join us just days after that spacecraft brings a sample from an asteroid to the Earth for the very first time. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. We depend on support from viewers just like you. To help support this program with a one-time donation or a paid subscription starting at just 99 cents a month, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. We also have a brand new retail store with interesting original gifts for anyone who loves space and astronomy. Search for The Cosmic Companion on Society6 or visit thecosmiccompanion.net and click on shop. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net. Mm -hmm.